What's up, everybody? Chris Trapasso here for another episode of the Nameless Football Show. I think Tuesdays at 6.30, 6.35 is going to be the scheduled, regularly scheduled airing of the Nameless Football Show every single week. If you see me look down into my right, I'm just looking down at my computer here to see any of your questions. That's one cool thing about the Nameless Football Show. Any questions that you have, I will answer. I will interrupt what I have planned for the Nameless Football Show to get your comment on the air and hopefully get a somewhat astute um, opinion or answer on it. Today I wanted to dedicate, I got to pull up my email here where I had some in my drafts, my notes. I want to do playoff predictions. I was sitting there this morning uh, with my two daughters and watching Good Morning Football on my computer on YouTube TV. By the way, I, I got dressed up for the occasion. The Johnny Cash purple t-shirt. I feel like Johnny Cash wouldn't have been a big purple t-shirt wearer. So I went with a black liquid death hat to pay homage to, to Johnny Cash for this episode of the Nameless Football Show. Um, I'm watching Good Morning Football. That was a quick rant on my attire for this. To me, what feels like the first Nameless Football Show, even though I did come live to you guys a lot um, during the summer. But this, with an NFL game two days away, like 48 hours away, or 49 hours away, I should say, um, it feels like the first NFL show for the Nameless Football Show for this season. I'm watching Good Morning Football this morning, and they're doing their playoff predictions. Not the predictions all the way through the playoffs, but the playoff bracket predictions. Jamie Erdahl, Jason McCourty, Peter Schrager, and then last but not least, certainly not least, Kyle Brandt gave his predictions. Uh, I thought they all did a great job. Um, I wrote an article at CBS Sports that was out yesterday. Let me get this here so I can see your questions. Um, we're getting a question already from Kyle, so just quick pause there. Um, again, I'm Chris Passo from CBSSports.com, NFL draft analyst, young player analyst, scouting gradebook founder. I run the practice squad power rankings. I'm the founder there, too. That will come out Friday. I'm so excited to get that project rolling again. But I got a question from Kyle. Um, what's your Browns Panthers game prediction? I have 24, 20 Panthers. I think the Panthers do win that game week one. And I think it could be a, a little more than that. I could see maybe a touch lower scoring, like 23, 17, something in that range. I, I like Jacoby Brissett as a backup. I think he's one of the better backups in the league, but there's such a big level down when you go from almost every starter in football down to a backup. So I, I, I think Baker Mayfield is going to be out for revenge. I like LaVisca Chanel. I like DJ Moore. I like Robbie Anderson. I think the offensive line in Carolina will be a little better. It's not going to be great. It's not going to be a road grading defensive line. And oh, by the way, Christian McCaffrey is back. And they were 3-0 and last season before Christian McCaffrey got hurt. Now, I'm not going to be one to say that a running back is the reason why the Panthers were 3-0 and to start the season last year. But I do think someone with that versatile of a skill set and that dynamic of a talent in Christian McCaffrey can certainly swing the needle in the direction in favor of the Panthers. So I, I think without Deshaun Watson, all the negative PR this offseason for the Browns, what's really been the case almost every single season since they've gotten back to Cleveland in 1999, the Browns are going to lose week one, I think by around six or seven points to the Carolina Panthers. But anyway, so... I want to run through my playoff bracket predictions. And the point I was getting to before I got to Kyle's question was that I wrote an article at CBS Sports um, for on Labor Day, or that was published Labor Day, that was just kind of a uh, reminder for fans that were so excited. I wrote this last year, and I created this phenomenon called in excitement-induced brain fog. And what that means is just you're so excited for the season – you're so excited to see your best friend who you haven't seen in nine months that when you finally see that best friend, you're like, uh, oh, what what are we talking about? What's going on? Like, you don't have a clear mind. That's what ha I think happens to a lot of fans um, at the start of the NFL season, that you're so pumped for week one, that Sunday of week one, Thursday night, to open the season, that you forget a lot of things that are facts or that absolutely need ha to happen or do happen in every football season. I bring that up because around six, almost seven new playoff teams happen every single year. Last season, we had seven new playoff teams from the season before. In 2020, six new playoff teams. And of recent memory, it's right around six. Now, of course, we've since expanded 
or the NFL has expanded to seven teams in each conference making the playoffs, so that could ultimately grow larger. And I think for the most part, the GMFB crew did a good job picking new teams, but it is. It, it's hard at the beginning of any football season to look at the teams that you know that you just saw the end of the season in January and, and into February for the Super Bowl and pick against those teams, that the teams that were in the divisional round, in the AFC title, NFC title, Super Bowl, they got to be back to the playoffs, right? That's not the, usually the case. So I tried to go with certainly what I thought was going to happen for these brackets, and while factoring in, there needs to be about six or seven new playoff teams that did not make the postseason last year. Uh, Kyle Brandt with the Panthers pick, I won't mind. Yeah, Kyle Brandt picked the Carolina Panthers to win the NFC South, which is like seems crazy right now. But again, last year, the Bengals were coming off a 4-13 season or 4-12, whatever it was, and no one picked them to win the AFC North, and certainly no one picked them to go to the Super Bowl. So that just keep those things in mind. I will start like the GMFB crew did um, with the NFC playoff bracket. Now, again, this is the Nameless Football Show. I'm Chris Trapasso from CBS Sports, NFL Draft, and Young Player Analyst. Uh, I have young breakout players coming out tomorrow. That's my top 10. Kind of to borrow again from GMFB, Peter Schrager came out with his top 10 most likely breakouts. I've done a lot of breakout articles throughout the summer. I mashed them together and picked my top 10 and ranked them in likelihood of breaking out. That will come out tomorrow. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments section. I'll look right down here on my computer. I have kind of a very uh, primitive setup here, but I have my phone connected to my computer, got the ring light going, and I will look down and answer any questions or any comments that you have here in the comment section. So with anything else, I think I got everything else out. Uh, let's start with the NFC bracket. I will go by divisions, and I'm going to start in the NFC East. I am one of the many people who have, over the last month or so, hopped on the Eagles bandwagon. Fly, Eagles, fly this season. I, I just feel like the Eagles were a clear step below the Cowboys last season, and that showed by the fact that the Cowboys won the NFC East. The Eagles were the wild card team. They were that number seven seed last year. It feels like the Cowboys were extremely stagnant. No, it doesn't feel like they were extremely stagnant. They were extremely stagnant. Uh, trading away Amari Cooper, not getting a lot in return. I love Michael Gallup coming out of Colorado State. I thought he was underrated. Uh, gave the Cowboys great returns on being a third-round pick at wide receiver. But it's Michael Gallup and CeeDee Lamb, Dalton Schultz, who did flash a little bit last season as a tight end. Um, you lose the L. Collins on the offensive line. You don't have Tyron Smith for most of the season. I like Dak. I think at times he can be a borderline elite quarterback. The Eagles did the opposite of staying stagnant. They built this team around Jalen Hurts. Now, if you're just doing a quarterback comparison, I like Dak Prescott more than Jalen Hurts. He didn't do a lot from a passing perspective last season that really impressed me. I think Nick Sirianni did a fantastic job scheming open throws for him. But now we can scheme those open throws for Jalen Hurts to A.J. Brown. And Devontae Smith can kind of take a back seat as that 1A or that number 2 receiver. There's no more Jalen Rager. There's no more J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. They got return for those guys. Um, the offensive line should still be very good. And what they've done on defense to add uh, James Bradbury to that group with Darius Slay, um, I, N'Kobe Dean. I, I wasn't huge in terms of value on the Jordan Davis pick, but he'll certainly help keep that extra defender out of the box. He's going to occupy multiple defenders or offensive linemen as that interior defender on the Eagles front. So I think the Eagles do win the NFC North and I will, or the NFC East, and I will rank where I have them. I have them as the number four seed. I think they'll take a step forward to a certain degree. I think the hype for the Eagles has gotten a little bit crazy because, like I said, I, I didn't love, like, I don't think Jordan Davis is going to come in and be in Dominican Sue and be just instant impact, pass rusher, dominant run defender. Um, as a rookie, I like N'Kobe Dean. I like the pieces in the secondary. I like the offensive pieces. I don't know if Jalen Hurts, too, is ready to enter the top 12 or top 10 conversation at the quarterback spot. But based on what Nick Sirianni and that coaching staff did last year, I think the Eagles can do enough to scheme open throws, get him the ball, you know, 
get the ball out of his hands in a hurry, bubble screens, tunnel screens, R tons of RPOs, allow him to run. Certainly want to use Jalen Hurts in the design run game and to be enough to win, to squeak out maybe by a game or two over the Dallas Cowboys. Um, got a comment down here. Adam Rank says both Mooney and Montgomery are going to break out. Odds of a Chicago miracle run. It's not preposterous because last year, think about this. Like I said, the Bengals were the team that made that, that crazy jump that no one saw coming. And what were the ingredients for that Bengals crazy jump? They had a second-year quarterback that was good as a rookie but not great. I mean, Joe Burrow looked solid. He didn't look like he was ready to become an elite quarterback before he tore his ACL as a rookie. The Bears could be better than people expect if Justin Fields has a similar jump. I don't think he needs to become you know, potential MVP candidate like Joe Burrow was late in the season last year for the Bears to be better. I, I don't think the Bears, though, are ready to make that playoff push. I think in 2023, if they see a step forward from Justin Fields, they're going to want to say, okay, let's do what the Eagles did. Let's build. We don't have as much dead cap anymore. Let's build around Justin Fields. So the the, the beyond Darnell Mooney, who I love, and I think he could break out. To me, David Montgomery already broke out last season. Um, but if Justin Fields, to me, has the talent, the arm strength, the ball placement, certainly the athleticism, uh, if things slow down for him a little bit in terms of processing coverage, they could be a lot better than people think. And, and most people have them as one of the worst teams in the NFL. The roster is not great. Uh, I, I don't love the receiver group around him outside of Darnell Mooney. But if uh, Vilas Jones is as good of a yak specialist as he was at, at, at Tennessee, if Tevin Jenkins and Braxton Jones, young blockers up front, uh, play as well as I think they can play. I was big fans of both of those blockers coming into the NFL out of Southern Utah and um, Oklahoma State, then I think we could be talking about a Bears team that wins six or seven games, which at that point would certainly not be eligible for the playoffs, but you would be happy as a Bears fan saying, hey, look, we got like the most dead cap in the league. We've traded away a lot of our older stars, release guys, um, and we have a young quarterback in Justin Fields that looks very promising. All right, so number four. In the NFC East, or in the NFC, the NFC East winner, Philadelphia Eagles. The number three seed winning the division, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And, you know, Kyle just mentioned Kyle Brandt's pick of the uh, Carolina Panthers. I don't, I, I'm not going to go that far, but I don't think this season with the Buccaneers is going to be a walk in the park. I, I am a little bit lower on the Saints. I think the Panthers will be better than people expect mostly due to the addition of Baker Mayfield and some pieces up front on both sides of the line. And the Falcons are certainly rebuilding, but it's not all about what's going on in your division. I just think Brady now at his age, Chris Godwin coming off the injury, um, they lost some pieces up front on the offensive line, Alex Kappa. Um, they do bring in Shaq Mason, but he's getting up there in age at this point. The defensive line, I, I don't know outside of Shaq Barrett, who else is a real intimidating outside pass rushing presence. You still have Mike Evans, but he's into his 30s now. I think the Bucs will be good. I think they'll win the division. I'm, I'm still putting trust in Tom Brady. He's done nothing in his career to make me not trust in him getting his team to double-digit wins and, and making it to the postseason. I just don't think they're going to be dominant. I don't think they're going to run away completely with the NFC South. But I have them as the three seed, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, out of the South. And again, I'm Chris Trapasso, CBSSports.com. This is the Nameless Football Show Playoff Bracket Prediction episode. If you have a question or a comment, drop it right down there and I will answer it. The number two seed in the NFC. Decently chalk at this point because these are three teams that already made the playoffs last season. And if you heard my intro, I'm going for six new teams because that's normally what happens. I am going with the Green Bay Packers. They're going to be in a dogfight with the Minnesota Vikings. I love Justin Jefferson. Um, even tra trading for Jalen Rager to be that wide receiver three behind Jay, uh, Adam Thielen, Dalvin Cook. The offensive line should be good. The Packers will win it by like a tiebreaker or by a half a game. Something very close. They're going to win the AFC or the NFC North. A little concerned about not having an offense that runs directly through someone like it did with Devontae Adams. But I think LaFleur has... His track record speaks for itself. How many games he's won early in his Green Bay head coaching career. Aaron Rodgers is still Aaron Rodgers. I think actually dispersing the football 
will be better. And it's more Mike Shanahan-esque than what the Packers were doing last season where the offense just funneled through Devontae Adams. And if he was on the COVID list or not healthy or facing an elite corner, it was difficult for that offense to really be good. And watch out for A.J. Dillon. A.J. Dillon is the guy for me that I think he's going to be a big breakout guy um, as someone who has been waiting in the wings behind Aaron Jones and has fresh legs and really thick, quadzilla-esque fresh legs. Uh, I think the defense, too, is very, very good. Rashawn Gary could be another one that breaks out and becomes an elite edge rusher this season. But I kind of think Rashawn Gary already broke out last year. So Philadelphia Eagles as the number four seed out of the NFC East. Three seed, Tampa Bay Buccaneers out of the South. Two seed, Green Bay Packers out of the North. And that leaves the NFC West. We all heard about the AFC West. I'll get to them. The NFC West has been super competitive over the past four or five years. I'm going with the San Francisco 49ers. I am fully believing in Trey Lance and the job that Kyle Shanahan is going to be able to do maximizing this elite talent. I mean, yes, we've barely seen him. One season at North Dakota State, a few games last season in, in like relief appearances and some garbage time where he wasn't great, didn't look fully ready. But Kyle Shanahan's track record of elevating the likes of Brian Hoyer and Nick Mullins and C.J. Beathard uh, and then getting an Offensive Rookie of the Year season out of RG3 and an MVP season out of Matt Ryan, Trey Lance is the most physically gifted quarterback that Kyle Shanahan has ever coached. And that's maybe just a little bit ahead of RG3, 2012, rookie year RG3. He's got a bigger arm, a little bit more bulk to his frame than RG3 had. I think he's going to be a smarter runner than RG3 was um, in that rookie season, which was amazing. Beyond that, it's not all about coaching. It's not about scheming it up. Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Trent Williams on defense, Nick Bosa, Charles Amenahue, watch out for that name, Charles Amenahue. They traded for him last season from the Houston Texans, third round pick out of the University of Texas. Long, super versatile, can play anywhere up front. Very good pass rusher in a limited sample size last season in San Francisco. I think he's going to be a big part of that defense moving forward. Fred Warner, um, Jimmy Ward at safety, maybe some, some cornerback questions, but I think this is a team that when they've had a healthy quarterback, even with Jimmy Garoppolo, they've gotten to two NFC title games and one Super Bowl with that lineup, with a lot of those foundational stars with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think Trey Lance will maybe turn the ball over a little bit more to start, but it's such a quarterback-friendly offense. The NFC West will be a 49ers and Rams race, and this time the 49ers are going to win. Now, remember last season, they did lose, obviously, in the NFC title game by three on the road to the Rams. During the regular season, they beat the Rams 31-10, and then they beat them in overtime at the end of the regular season. So during the regular season, Kyle Shanahan had Sean McVay's number, and this season with Trey Lance, an upgrade in terms of just overall skill set at the quarterback spot. He's not a better quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo yet. But by the end of the season, I think a lot of people are going to say, wow, this is someone that fits the mold of the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow-ish mold. Improvisation, arm strength, confidence, uh, big-time talent at the quarterback position in a quarterback-friendly offense with a ton of stars. Like, I get a lot of predictions wrong, but last year, before the playoffs, my editors asked me and said, hey, do you want to do a TikTok on the team that could be the scary team to that would to kind of surprise, to be the dark horse team, to maybe be a wild card club that could make it all the way to the Super Bowl. And I picked easily in two seconds the 49ers. And I was super close. I was three points away from being correct because I, I knew that they were going to go into Dallas and win that game. There's just too much star power on that roster. And now they have a freaky specimen at the quarterback spot. All right, again, if anyone has any questions, I'm through... My top four seeds and four division winners in the NFC. I'm Chris Trapasso. This is the Nameless Football Show. Uh, Eagles, the four seed, winning the NFC East. Bucks, the three seed, winning the NFC South. Packers, winning the NFC North. All chalk there. All guys, all players that were in the postseason last year. Packers coming out of the NFC North, barely squeaking by the Vikings. 
and the San Francisco 49ers winning the NFC West. Trey Lance, Fred Warner, Nick Bosa, Trent Williams, and even Elijah Mitchell was really good as a rookie last season in that zone blocking team that Kyle Shanahan runs. Brandon Ayuk's supposed to break out too. We've been waiting for that for a couple seasons, but Brandon Ayuk, former first round pick, explosive dynamic yards after the catch. If he does that, they have Danny Gray too, 4 3 3 guy. That if you look back at Kyle Shanahan's career, Taylor Gabriel in Atlanta, Travis Benjamin in Cleveland, Marquise Goodwin in San Francisco, he loves that burner. And he's gotten the most, he's gotten the best statistical seasons out of those small niche burners in the past. And that's why they drafted Danny Gray um, when they did in the third round at SMU. He's super fast. He's not a super complete wide receiver, but he fits and complements what the 49ers do very well. Your order is the exact same as mine with the same teams. Oh, Cannonball Sports. Sounds good. Um, okay. Wild cards. I don't want to go crazy long. I, I want to keep the name of this football show right at around 30 minutes, so I'm not keeping you on your phone for too long at night. Number five, the five seed is going to be the Rams. They're still going to be very good. We know Sean McVay, his track record. He gets to the postseason. He's been to two Super Bowls. Uh, they're going to win double-digit games, maybe a game or two behind the 49ers. They're going to be the five seed. Matt Stafford, Cooper Cup, Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey. I mean, talk about star power all over that roster. It's certainly there. I think losing Andrew Whitworth, we're going to see the impact of that um, this season, that Stafford's not going to be quite as comfortable in the pocket. Bobby Wagner's there. I like him. I think he's still a good run defender. I don't know how great he is in coverage this stage of his career. The offensive line being a little bit of a question mark is kind of sort of the main reason I have the Rams not winning the NFC West, but still finishing it as the five seed. The six seed, there's your Minnesota Vikings. I, I think Kirk Cousins has a ceiling. The Vikings, even as they switch over to a new regime, understand that ceiling and actually kind of like it. They realize, hey, look, his ceiling isn't crazy high, but his floor is also not that low. And we have a superstar, like historically great superstar wide receiver in Justin Jefferson. We still have Adam Thielen that could any, you know, in any game at any Sunday go for 10 plus catches if you really wanted him to underneath. You'd bring in a former first round pick, Jalen Rager. You have Delvin Cook. You have a healthy Irv Smith who was great after the catch at Alabama when he was fully healthy. I love what they've done on the offensive line. Christian Derisaw was on Peter Schrager's list for breakout stars. I loved him at the left tackle spot coming out of Virginia Tech. You got Brian O'Neill at the right tackle spot, one of the best young right tackles in football. I think it's going to be a good offensive line. And defensively, I think they'll be good enough. I don't think they're going to be stellar defensively. Having Daniel, um, Danell Hunter back will certainly help uh, the pass rush. I think it's going to have a ripple effect on the secondary. The Vikings as the sixth seed. Any other questions? Love your content, man. Keep up the great content. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching and following. I greatly appreciate it. I never thought I'd have a following like this on TikTok, but I love it. I love being able to post videos and do these live shows like the Nameless Football Show with you guys. And the seven seed. So this is my version of Kyle Brandt picking the Carolina Panthers at or to win the NFC South. My version of that is the Detroit Lions finishing as the number seven seed. So again, remember, I went into this trying to make the best predictions as possible, obviously. But I also realized there are going to be new teams in the playoff bracket. And I think because we saw so much of the star power shift from the NFC to the AFC, Devontae Adams, Russell Wilson, uh, Chandler Jones, Randy Gregory, those four or five big pieces that were all in the NFC that are now in the AFC, I think the NFC is pretty watered down. And, and to look at the rest of the conference I think the Cowboys, like I said, are going to regress. And don't don't crush me, Cowboys fans. I know how passionate you are, and I know how good that team is. I think the Lions, with Dan Campbell, who's a lot better of a coach than I thought he was going to be. The players really uh, have gotten behind him and believe in him. I like what they've done roster-wise. I love Amon Ross St. Brown, TJ Hawkinson. Um, the offensive line, this is one thing that I feel even more confident in. At the end of the season... The Detroit Lions offensive line will be a top five unit in the NFL. With Penny Sewell, Taylor Decker, Frank Ragnow, Jonah Jackson, that is a really promising group up front with a good mix of veterans and young talent. Jonah Jackson was a pro bowler already. He's so balanced. Penny Sewell obviously has all the talent in the world. He's just really coming into his own as a 22-year-old 
in his second season. Uh, and Taylor Decker's been one of the better, more steady tackles in football when he's healthy. And Frank Ragnow's one of the best centers in football. So that's going to help Jared Goff. I think if you don't have a good offensive line in front of Jared Goff, you're going to get bad quarterback play. You are. But the, with that good of an offensive line, and with Aiden Hutchinson on defense, the Aquar uh, brothers up front, I like... Um, Jeffrey Akuda to rebound from where he's been in his first two seasons. Obviously got hurt early on last year. I think the Lions are going to... They went like 0-6 in one-score games last season. That's not going to happen again. Or 1-6. They went 1-6. They won at the buzzer against the Vikings. Beyond that, they were losing so many close games last year. I think they're, that's going to flip. I'm not going to say they're going to go 6-7-1, and seven and one, but they'll be more even in those one-score games. And they are a good team that will absolutely play hard every single week. Look out, too, for DJ Chark to come off injury and actually be a good player on the perimeter with Amon Ross St. Brown and TJ Hawkinson uh, there in the slot. So the Lions, that's my surprise team. The Lions as a seven seed in the NFC as the final wild card spot. So that's two new teams, Vikings and Lions in the NFC. And remember, of recent memory, I think like the last decade or so, or actually more than that, I think it's like 15 years. Six, around six new teams every year. And we've had two seasons now with the, or was it just, was last year the first year? Yeah, last year was the first year of seven teams in the playoffs. We had seven last year. So, but it's usually right around six. So there's two new teams that I have in the NFC. When they do move on from golf, trade for someone or draft a QB? Um, it's a good question. This is on the Lions. I think they should just draft someone. I mean, they'll have enough of a youth movement on that roster with Hutchinson and Penny Sewell, Amon Ross St. Brown, where you don't necessarily need to throw in a veteran at that point. And, and I don't know, I mean, outside of Tom Brady, there, there hasn't really been a ton of crazy successful trade for a veteran quarterback projects in the NFL. I guess Kirk Cousins has been to the playoffs um, after being traded, but in general, I think just draft a quarterback. It seems like it's going to be a good quarterback class. It, it's going to be a good quarterback class. They should just pick a quarterback. You don't need to get the first one. You don't need to get number one overall. You can still get, I mean, Josh Allen was the third quarterback picked in that 2018 draft class. You can certainly get one later in the first round that can still ultimately be good and just fit the culture there in Detroit. All right. Again, any questions you have? Drop them in the comment section. I'm going to hurry up quickly because I've gone a little bit long. I'm just so pumped. Uh, to the AFC playoff prediction bracket. Playoff bracket prediction, actually. I'm getting my words screwed up here because I'm so pumped. At the four spot, winning the division, the Indianapolis Colts. I think with Matt Ryan, I mean, speaking about or just talking about teams that traded for a quarterback and just going to try to roll the dice, the Colts and their GM, Chris Ballard, like no team has loved doing that more. To go from Phillip Rivers to Carson Wentz, now Matt Ryan. I think he'll be solid. I mean, Matt Ryan was solid on some good Falcons teams, won an MVP with Kyle Shanahan. And over the past couple of seasons, since that Super Bowl, he's been good. Not great, never fabulous, very rarely horrible. They have a very good offensive line. They want to run the football. I'm still not quite fully bought into the hype around Michael Pittman, but a lot of people think that he could become like a true, legitimate number one this year. I don't love the weapons around him. But I think on defense, with Shaquille Leonard, formerly Darius, Darius Leonard, now Shaquille Leonard, known as DeForest Buckner in the middle, Grover Stewart, who's so underrated at that nose tackle spot, um, Yannick Ngakwe, Stefan Gilmore, who I think is certainly probably a step slower than he was when he won the Defensive Player of the Year in 2019. But to have him on that uh, defense, which is also has Kenny Moore, who's one of the most underrated defensive players, not just corners, defensive players in all of football, I think defensively the Colts are going to be a really tough team to beat. They have a different style than really any other team. Suffocating defense and run game, and now they have a quarterback that's not going to make those boneheaded mistakes like Carson Wentz did last season. The Colts get into the playoffs, and they're one of the new teams. They weren't in it last year. They had a very disappointing finish. I was almost going to swear and say something bad. Uh, they did not play well in Jacksonville, and they had to just beat the hapless Jaguars. Uh, they crept it down their leg was what I was going to say. I don't know if that's swearing or not. Uh, they crept it down their leg in the season finale, but they're going to be back in the playoffs. Uh, okay, so that's four. The three seed. 
Los Angeles Chargers. And that was so hard to do. The AFC West is absolutely loaded. I'm just all in, like I am with Trey Lance in the NFC. I'm all in on Justin Herbert. I think Justin Herbert, Brandon Staley, going with an analytics-based game plan that he kind of got burned on a couple times last year. But in the long run, going for those fourth downs, not being afraid to to say, hey, we're not going to kick the field goal. We're going to go for it. We have Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Josh Palmer. We're going to go for these fourth downs when everyone's telling us to punt or just take the points. Eventually, that's going to turn out in their favor. I think Justin Herbert's in for a big season. They have Rashawn Slater at left tackle. They see Zion Johnson fall into their laps at the guard position. I still think the offensive line might be a little bit leaky, but to have two first-round offensive linemen in back-to-back drafts fall into their lap, that was awesome. And then you got Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, uh, J.C. Jackson, you sign in free agency, Derwin James, loaded. I mean, it's kind of like the 49ers. They have so much star power, and I certainly trust and have more faith in Justin Herbert than I do Trey Lance at this point, just because I've seen Justin Herbert do it. And he really absolutely can do it. They're the three seed. I think just... Being in that AFC West, they're going to beat up on each other a little bit. I think the Chargers could be one of the scariest three seeds that we've seen in a long time. The two seed, new team, and Chargers would be a new team as well, so that's four. The fifth newest team, or the fifth new team in the playoffs that wasn't in last year, that's going to get in this year, the two seed, Baltimore Ravens. They were plagued with injuries like from the get-go last year. Uh, I don't love the weapons around Lamar Jackson. Everything else about this team, I like. They have their identity. They're going to blitz a ton, even though they don't have Wink Martindale at defensive coordinator. Mike McDonald's going to blitz a ton. Uh, They have Marcus Peters back. Marlon Humphrey's one of the most underrated corners, can play inside and outside equally as well, almost an elite level. Um, Odafe Owe could be very good um, in his second season. I wasn't crazy high on him coming into the draft, but I think he flashed as kind of that stunter, blitzing type that's just going to win with sheer athleticism alone. Um, they have Mark Andrews, who's really, really good. I think saw some bets out there where you can get some decent money in terms of value on him leading the league in receptions. And that could be the case. There's Rashad Bateman, who has all the makings. If you just look at his profile from college to the NFL of breaking out in year two. So if he does that with Lamar Jackson's running ability with JK Dobbins and Gus Edwards, uh, they just have so many pieces that, allow them to accentuate their talent on offense and defense. And it feels like if they're not struck by the COVID bug like they were last year and injuries the year before, whatever it was, uh, that they are a playoff team. And I think the Bengals will be good, but this will be one of the new teams. The Baltimore Ravens just perennially a playoff contender under John Harbaugh and with Eric DaCosta there at their general manager spot. The one seed is going to be the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I not only believe in the star power of the Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, Von Miller, uh, but the depth of that team. Like last year, what they had, they were they won the AFC East, but they had like no Pro Bowlers or whatever it was. Ultimately, when the All Pro list came out, Jordan Poyer was an All Pro, but that's kind of the embodiment of what Sean McDermott does. He throws defensive line rotation at you in waves everyone in the fourth quarter of games and in the fourth quarter of the season up front for the bills is fresh because they're all playing between 30 and 50 percent of the snaps they're not running anyone into the ground they have ed oliver i love the free free agent acquisition of tim settle daquan jones is going to be an upgrade at that block eating nose tackle spot over star latulale um kair elam they bring him in in the first round at cornerback, you still have the best safety tandem in football in Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. The offensive line adds Roger Saffold. Um, Spencer Brown, the rookie last year, flashed down the stretch. He's fully healthy. Then you had James Cook to the offense. And you had Khalil Shakir and Jamison Crowder and Gabriel Davis, Dawson Knox. They're just so deep. It's not a team that if Stephon Diggs does not have a big game, they won't be able to score 30 points. I think they will be able to do that. A lot. I don't see Stephon Diggs having a lot of pedestrian games, but if that is the case, if teams say we are just not letting Stephon Diggs go for 150 against us, they have other weapons. And the defense, coached by a defensive-minded coach in Sean McDermott and with his defensive coordinator, Leslie Frazier, that's been around the block, they're going to be really good defensively too. So the Bills, the AFC East will be better, but the Bills will win the AFC East and be the one seed in the AFC. All right, any other questions? Um, 
See, mm -hmm. I gotta scroll up here. I think they should run two tight ends with a slot that's talking about the Ravens. I absolutely agree. Um, James Cook, yeah, the Bills add speed finally to that backfield. They're just really, really deep, and they have the star power, and they have Josh Allen. Okay, now for the wild card teams, I'm going to sign off. It's going a little longer than I wanted to. Um, at the five spots, the Kansas City Chiefs. I can't quit the Chiefs yet. I, I at the time, didn't like at all the trading of Tyreek Hill because I thought might not call him the best receiver in football, but he's the scariest receiver in football. What he can do with the ball in his hands or just going over the top of a defense, scarier than any receiver. But to bring in MVS and Juju Smith-Schuster, land my one of my favorite wide receivers in the entire draft class. I think my number three overall wide receiver, Sky Moore in the second round. You still have Travis Kelsey, Isaiah Pacheco at the undrafted free agent ranks. The running back out of Rutgers. You still have Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, who can still play a little bit. You have Ronald Jones, um, an offensive line that should be very good again. And defensively, to add some pieces on that side of the ball as well. George Karloft is in the first round. Trent McDuffie wasn't as high on him, but I think he'll be an upgrade just in terms of talent at the cornerback position. Um, Justin Reed to that secondary at the safety spot. He's not going to be Tyron Matthew, but he's not considerably worse than Tyron Matthew. The Chiefs... It's going to be a, a dogfight in the NFC West and the AFC West. The Chiefs will just be narrowly beaten out to win the division by the Chargers, but will land as the top wildcard seed. Then I have the Bengals at number six. I, I think we're, it's all about star power. It's not like the NFL is becoming the NBA, but if you have those premier talents, uh, it certainly goes a long way to not just have a good quarterback or not just have a good receiver group like the Bengals have, but to have... Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard and Joseph Osai, keep an eye out for him coming off a torn Achilles last season, was super explosive in the preseason, second-round pick out of Texas in 2021. I think he tore his Achilles. Um, Logan Wilson at the linebacker spot. To add Daxton Hill to that secondary, I think, was awesome. To add uh, Cam Taylor Britt, another very opportunistic and playmaking cornerback. To add to kind of what was a patchwork veteran group last season that overachieved really in the playoffs. I really like what the Bengals have built around Joe Burrow. They're going to just narrowly lose out on winning the, the NFC North for the second straight season, but they absolutely are a playoff team. And last but not least, this was the, the toughest pick for my playoff bracket predictions. Uh, the seven seed in the AFC. And this is what happened on GMFB this morning. They were all like, oh my God, look at all these teams. You got the Steelers, you got the Dolphins, you got the Broncos, you got the Raiders. So many good teams on paper, but only seven can make it. I did a last minute change. I had one team written in. I had the Dolphins written in. I flipped it to the Denver Broncos. And that means the Raiders I do not have making the playoffs. I just am not quite a full believer in Derek Carr just yet. And even if you could convince me that I should be, I don't love the offensive line. I'm a little bit concerned about the offensive line. And I think if Derek Carr is behind one of the best offensive lines in football, okay, we've seen that from Derek Carr over the past couple seasons. He can be really good. I don't think the offensive line is going to be good enough in that AFC West, in the loaded AFC conference for them to make the playoffs. It's just too competitive. I went with the Broncos over the Dolphins. They're not the same teams. They're not mirrors of each other in Denver and Miami. Denver has a, a deep like a deep receiver room, but not the star power like Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. But they have Cortland Sutton and, and Jerry Judy, um, Albert Akui Boonham. But I don't love the Dolphins' pass rush. I, I, I don't think – I mean, Jalen Phillips was pretty good as a rookie, not great. Emmanuel Agba is kind of your – guy that you're propping up as your number one outside rusher. Uh, the offensive lines, uh, probably the edge goes to Miami. I uh, Actually, probably not. Probably to Denver. You have Teron Armstead at, at left tackle, who I'll take over Garrett Bowles. But I think the rest of the group in Denver is better. Even if you s slightly put, in terms of overall roster, to have Xavier Howard, Javon Holland, and Byron Jones in that secondary over what the Broncos have. They have Justin Simmons. They have Patrick Sertan. I went with the quarterbacks, and I, I think Tua will be better. I think they will be on the cusp of the playoffs. They could maybe miss out on the last week of the regular season, like the Colts did last year. I just don't I, – I can't take Tua over Russell Wilson. That Russell Wilson took so many 
mediocre Seahawks teams to the playoffs almost single-handedly after the Legion of Boom was dissipated. We're just like, how are the Seahawks going 10-6? and six? Like, look at the roster. It's not really that good. I think Russell Wilson will do enough. Yes, he's getting up there in age. He's 33 years old. He will do enough to just allow the Broncos to squeak into the playoffs. They have a pretty good defense. I love the addition of Randy Gregory to pair him with Bradley Chubb. Josie Jewell at linebacker, very underrated. I mentioned Justin Simmons. Patrick Sertan, second-year cornerback who they like a lot. Uh, Javante Williams, the running back, I think he's going to be the fantasy RB1, Javante Williams, at the end of the season. He's that good. That timeshare with Melvin Gordon, nothing against Melvin Gordon. He was a great first-round pick, been very productive in his career. Javante Williams will be the feature back by mid-October. So there it is. AFC, Bills number one seed, Ravens number two seed, Chargers number three, Colts number four, Chiefs as the first wild card, then the Bengals, then the Broncos. And that was tough. Picking the Broncos was tough over the Raiders and over the Dolphins. Those are the two other teams that I considered, but I went with Russell Wilson, the quarterback who I trust the most. In the NFC, 49ers the one seed, Packers the two seed, Bucks the three seed, Eagles the four seed, Rams the five seed, Vikings the six seed, and the Lions the six seed, and that or the seven seed. And that gives you six new playoff teams, which historically is what happens every single year. How do you think Baker will play this season? I think he's going to be better. I think he's going to be closer to rookie season Baker Mayfield. Don't love everything going on roster-wise on both sides of the ball in Carolina. Carolina is going to be better, though. They could win six or seven games. And I think I said it on a previous Nameless Football show. At the end of the season, after all of these years of, oh, well, Baker doesn't have this, doesn't have that, but he kind of got pushed down the the pecking order in terms of the quarterback rankings, I think people say, hey, you know what? The team wasn't great, but Baker actually played pretty well. And if they can maybe build around him, he might have something as kind of a second go at it in his NFL career in Carolina. All right. That's going to do it for the first in-season episode of the Nameless Football Show. Be sure to tune in every single Tuesday at 6, maybe 6.35 p.m. Eastern Time. Tell your friends. Ask your questions. I'm Chris Trapasso from CBS Sports. You were just watching the Nameless Football Show. I got to end it this way because...